been asked to look at a patient who has hoarseness by a colleague and he wants to know why the patient hasn't gotten better with the treatment. I think this is a good time to go into this particular neurologic disorder because I think it's one of the most common missed disorders. So I'll walk through the video. Here is the patient. And first of all, he has a soft voice. He, he's leaking air. And if we stop the video here and watch, we see, first of all, that he doesn't quite close all the way. There's a gap, so that, that accounts for the softness. And what I want to look at here is the watch the right vocal process as I slow this down and go frame by frame. The right vocal process translates, that is, it goes, moves medial, but it doesn't rotate. The tip of the vocal process never comes towards the midline, so that gives us one clue. I think we see a second clue here, and that is that the endoscope is oriented right along the epiglottis, and the left false cord is covering up the left true vocal cord. That's a sign that the left side is working harder than the right. And we see another sign that the left side is working harder than the right. You can kind of see that there's fasciculations of the left arytenoid. That left arytenoid is working overly hard. Now, when we ask the patient to go loud, we hear flutter. And we see flutter. If we look really closely, even on the strobe exam here, watching the right vocal cord, you'll see that it flutters. The left false cord also flutters, but the right vocal cord, this flutter suggests that it lacks tension. We hear a sound, ee, and that's the sound coming from the left vocal cord, which we can't see, and the roughness is the flutter coming from the right vocal cord. So it's really important for the examiner, when you're thinking of a presis, to check at the very lowest pitch possible because that's going to aggravate. That's going to take the cricothyroid muscle out of the equation and demand that all of the tension come from the thyroid muscle. And here again we see there's flutter on the right vocal cord. There's the flutter again on the right cord. And the louder you get and the lower you go, the more you'll see that. Now, here, just during breathing, we actually can focus in on the vocal process. So here is the right vocal process. The left is here. First, let's watch the right. Here during this breathing, or specifically breathing out, expiration. So the right vocal process only moves in from here to here. And even when it moves in there, we can also see that it maintains this very obtuse angle. There's been no rotation of the vocal process medially. Now, if we focus our attention on the opposite side and we watch, the left side the vocal process is actually leading. Here the vocal process is following the posterior and here there is an acute angle. If we could extend this out or if we had our endoscope underneath, we would see that the vocal process is pushing there. And if we watch here, we can see Again, focusing our attention on the vocal process, look at the range on the left side. It's a very large range of motion. And the right side, if we focus on it, has a fairly small range of motion. Even though, at the end of that motion, the two vocal cords are almost completely lined up. Again, we could focus on the vocal process, or should focus on the vocal process. And we can see, when we slow it down, if we drew a midline here from the posterior to the anterior and we watch how much contribution each of the two vocal processes are making, we would see almost all the contribution is coming from the left side.
again, a big gap. The most closed here is when the two vocal cords are straight, we can see this large gap here. If you watch the left arytenoid here, you can see that the muscle is fatigued. And you see fasciculations or unsteadiness in that muscle. Um, and then moving along here, we get close. Um, this is where you can often see detail, but it happens quickly. And again, we're going to focus on the vocal processes here, focusing first, say, on the right and then on the left. We can see how much more closure came from the left than the right. And in fact, if we look at the edge of the vocal cord, we might even be able to appreciate that there's a little concavity here on the right side. Now, if we look here, we see both sides have an obtuse angle during inspiration. The left side goes to straight and then an acute angle. So if we could put the endoscope in underneath here, we would see that even better. Now, this technique that I haven't used much, but this is rapid motion, sort of breathing and sniffing. And this is a good way, this is a good way to appreciate, if you slow the video down, how much of the closure is coming from the left side. So the left vocal process is much more active than the right, and this is where you can see that the left vocal process is also pushing far medial. And if we slow this down again, and instead we watch the right vocal process, we can see the right vocal process hardly moves at all, while the left vocal process is rapidly moving and going through a much greater range of motion and crossing the central axis. So that actually leads to the second part, and that was the question of why a treatment, which was injecting both vocal cords, trying to get them closer together with an absorbable material, worked only part way. And the answer to that, I think, lies in the left side actually doesn't need anything. And when you put some, some injectable material into the left side, you've made the left side convex. And when you have a convexity, that means the weak side actually has to wrap around a, a convexity. And so that often will make the voice worse because the vocal cords can't line up. So there's an example of um, the convexity here, which makes it uh, more difficult to create a smooth sine wave uh, with oscillating the vocal cords. And then here we are uh, three months after the initial diagnosis. And again, I think if we follow the left vocal process, we see it's going through a much greater range of motion than the right. Here it is again. The left vocal cord's convex. The left vocal cord vocal process is rotating and the right vocal process is only translating. That is, there's no rotation of the tip of the vocal process, leaving this obtuse angle here. Here's a good example of, watch the minimum range that the right side goes through while the left side goes through a very large range. We'll slow this down. There's the left side coming to the middle left side going past the middle. And we still have a pretty big gap between the vocal cords leaking air. I think that this represents the right side as a weakness of both the lateral cricorytenoid and the thyroarytenoid muscle. And I also think that, so this is an anterior branch injury which supplies both of those muscles. And the treatment for this, I think, one is going to be, in this case, to let the, le the rest of the injectable material on the left absorb. But moving the right side to the midline is going to be helpful. And if this has been going on for more than a year, I would skip doing an injectable augmentation and move to an implant. And you want the implant to not only fill the vocal cord 
you, you want it to rotate the right vocal process so that it gets near the midline. So the left side no longer has to go past the midline, it only has to go to the midline in order to make a competent glottis. Anyway, that's my take. I think this is probably the most commonly missed neurologic injury of the larynx, that is an anterior branch injury of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, I think it happens both from viruses and since that branch has to duck in under the thyroid cartilage, in order to get here, I think that an intubation with a cuff that's inflated right under the vocal cords probably puts pressure on the anterior branch as it enters the larynx, and that may also be why it gets injured. Anyways, thanks for listening.